And as you are able, please stand and hear God's call to worship him. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, Amen. Let's remain standing for our first hymn. 169. Rejoice, ye pure in heart.
your Bibles, if you will, please, and open up to the passage this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you're using the Pew Bible, you'll find it there on page 1142. Our text this morning begins at uh, verse 12. Now, I should uh, warn you that uh, early yesterday morning, uh, our own Jim Wells contacted me to let me know that because of the time change, I have an extra hour to preach. <laughs> so when, it, when the clock gets to 11.30 and I'm still going, you know who to blame. Not me. No. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, let's begin reading at verse 12. Brothers and sisters, I remind you, this is the very word of God. Let's get a careful attention. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son of Man, I'm sorry, then the Son also himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all and in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So far, the reading of God's word. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, as your word has been read aloud in all of our hearing as your children, we come to you asking for your instruction that once again you would minister to all each of us by the strength and power of your Holy Spirit that we would be guided into an understanding of that truth that helps us live wisely, helps us gain knowledge and understanding so that we might worship you and love you even more. Father, for those purposes, I ask that you would please bless my thoughts and my words so that they would glorify you alone and that they would feed your sheep. In Christ's name, amen. One of the perennial challenges that the church has always had to deal with is that of false teachers. 
No matter what period of time we're talking about, whether it be the early church or modern day or all the times in between, the church has always had to deal with the issue of false teachers. Now, some of them are really easy to spot. They just spout off kind of nonsense, and it really, it's, it's really not hard. You kind of go, okay, you know. But some of the most dangerous things are those false teachers that weave in just enough truth to make it sound legitimate and get you going, oh, yeah, that, you know, that kind of makes sense a little bit. And even in this early period of the apostolic period's not even finished yet, they're still writing out scripture, which we have here in this letter to the Corinthians. Paul's having to deal with some teaching this popped up in Corinth. Now, Corinth, as we've been finding all throughout here, had lots of problems and lots of issues to deal with, and he's dealing with another one of them here in this chapter 15, a misunderstanding about the resurrection, a misunderstanding. He's having to fight for its truth because there are people there that are denying the reality of the resurrection. Now, in some circles and other churches, a lot of it kind of had this more of a Greek understanding, which is, well, you know, of course uh, the body isn't important. It's the spirit that is everything. And so just like that, you know, we want to get away from the material things and get to the spiritual things, and that's where its real existence is. And so, of course, the body means nothing. That doesn't seem to be the case here. The case seems to be here that there are either some that are saying that, yes, Christ was raised but that doesn't mean anything for us. We, could, we shouldn't expect to be raised. Or more likely that they were denying that Christ was physically raised at all. That they were concentrating more on this idea of, well, it's a spiritual truth. It's the spirit of the thing. It's a, it's a resurrection to a new attitude, a new orientation to life. But there's no, of course, there's no physicality because that kind of stuff doesn't happen. And of course, we want to agree with that. You know, I have done, I don't know how many funeral services I'm up to. I I don't even want to count, okay? I've yet, in the 20 plus years that I've been ministering the gospel, had a family come back to me and say, hey, you know what? Uh, So-and-so came back just the other day to life and uh, he's back and so uh, you'll be in church here pretty soon. We, We know that doesn't happen. That's not the natural order of things. But you see, Paul's wanting to zoom them in on a thing that at the root of the gospel, it's not a natural order that we're arguing for. It's a supernatural event. It is by the power of God that this is happening. Uh, Many of you who have been studying with me in Genesis midweek know that we've been dealing with the flood narrative. And one of the things that I have said to you is we're not arguing that the flood event was a purely natural event. It was a supernatural judgment. And so more than just natural processes were brought to bear on it. Well, it's the same thing here that Paul wants us to understand about the reality of the resurrection. He's not arguing for a natural occurrence of things. He's introducing a supernatural thing, a supernatural event. And of course, that's where, the, uh, that's where the false teachers very often get their foothold. You know, it comes along this. We're going uh, to make the Christian faith a little easier for you to grasp. We're going to take out those supernatural events that are so hard to believe because we live in this world and we know those things don't happen. We'll take out all the miracles and we'll glean what is really important. Good morals. Because that's what really Jesus we can learn from is good morals. And that has happened a lot through the history of the church and still to this very day. Where things like believing in the virgin birth, we're on the doorstep of Christmas, is optional. Where believing in the resurrection of Christ is optional. What really matters is those good morals that he's helping us understand. But Paul wants us to know here clearly, and I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that if we strip all those supernatural, powerful acts of God out of the scriptures, we no longer have Christianity. I can send you right up the road to a number of churches, 
temples, spiritual gathering places, and they will all agree that good morals are important for good living. But at the root, which is exactly what Pastor Pete brought to us, because it's the very first thing that Paul brought to us, is at the root of Christianity are the supernatural, powerful acts of God on our behalf. And without them, there is no good news. There is no good news. This 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is one of the most extensive discussions about the resurrection in all of the Bible. And he is having to deal with misunderstandings and he's wanting to get it right at the root so that we understand the vitality of this doctrine. First, he kind of enters into a a, a way of argument, a philosophical tool, where you take on the position of the person that you don't agree and then carry that out to its logical conclusions. Okay, let's assume, let's assume that you're right for a moment and there is no resurrection. What does that mean? What does that mean? If Christ is not raised, then what? That's where he starts out. Now, notice how we started. We proclaim that Christ is raised, but some of you are saying that there is no resurrection of the dead. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Okay, there's the, there's the foundation we're going to work from for a little bit. Well, what does that mean? First of all, it means the apostles are a bunch of liars. That's what it means. It means that I'm a liar. And that this man is a liar. That every time we stand up in this pulpit and proclaim to you a risen Savior, we're nothing but a bunch of frauds. How about that? Now, of course, our critics would love for us to (laughs) to sign off on that. So he first impugns the very character of the Apostle Paul that they came to respect and love. They're misrepresenting God. But you remember what he said back in verse 3 and 4 that Peter took us through last week? Let me reread verse 3 and 4 from this early part of this chapter. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Of first importance. It's the priority. He is saying more succinctly what I said a little bit ago. If you don't have these doctrines, you don't have the Christian faith. It's not present. It's not present. It's not optional. You see, one of the things that he's doing through this whole chapter is addressing a bunch of believers that he knows are being rattled. Their minds are being rattled by these false teachers. And he's inviting them to think through this issue with him. Here's what he's kind of doing per my sermon title. He wants them to think about what is your relationship with the grave? What is your relationship with your grave? Because you know you're going to have one one day, right? You know, we talk in uh, statistics all the time about the birth rate and the death rate, and I get what they mean by that. Let me give you what the death rate is. 100%. Don't worry, we're all going to make it. Should the Lord tarry, we're all going to make it. So what's your relationship with your grave? Is it your final destination? Or is it just the place where one day it'll be looked back as but one blip, one event in a much greater story? Grave issues to be considered, to be thought about. If Christ is not raised, then what? Your faith is futile. 
What are you hoping for? That you'll just be a better person? Nothing wrong with that. But you don't have to pursue that very long before you find out how hollow and empty that is. Your faith is futile. What are you believing for? That, that one day you're going to get good enough that you can actually pat yourself on the back and feel good about it? And I'm not talking about feeling good about it in, in front of the people that you want to impress. I'm talking about in those deep, dark places at home when you're by yourself and nobody else knows that you really feel good about the progress that you've made. I was told there'd be no introspection in this sermon. Your faith is futile if you think that this is just the best way. The best way to be a better person. The best way to have your best life now. Your faith is futile. Moreover, about that futility, you're still in your sins. If Christ is not raised, then your sins haven't been atoned for. Ah, but they would say, wait a minute, he already died, the sins are atoned for. Eh, how do you know that? Christ's resurrection was an absolute act of God to show that the deal is finished. In Romans, what does he say? He was raised for our what? Justification. Now, I'm one of those weirdos that likes the Old Testament. I make no apologies for that, but I just state it outright. And I would be willing to bet that a lot of you have forgotten that in the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, on Yom Kippur, there was one person allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, the high priest. Remember that? And do you remember what he had to do? He had to sacrifice for his own sins first. And uh, he had to get in the right garb. He had that great robe on, that high priestly robe. And uh, do you know what was on the robe attached to those robes? There were some bells. And uh, it wasn't, he wasn't a fashionista. It wasn't a style thing. They wanted to be here that he was still moving around. They wanted to be able to hear because he was the only one allowed on the other side of that veil. He also had a rope tied around his leg. Because they were worried that God's holiness might consume him if the sacrifice was not acceptable to God. Every year on Yom Kippur, he emerged, and it was God's testimony. You're keeping my covenant. The sacrifice, temporary as it is, looking forward to the true one, is acceptable. Christ emerged from the tomb, folks, to show us that his once-for-all sacrifice was completely accepted by God. Remember I told you that story not too many months ago about that first car that I bought and that nice little payment booklet that I'd take into the bank to make a payment each month and that glorious stamp that came on the last payment in that book? What did it say? Paid in full. You see, Christ emerges on Easter morning and it's exactly like that stamp. It's God's testimony paid in full. It's been accepted. This is the work of the great high priest according to the plan of the Father. And everything has been accepted. Everything's right. What else? Well, those loved ones that you've already put in their graves, they're lost forever if Christ has not been raised. There's no hope for them ever from escaping from the clutches of the grave. If you say that there's, Christ has not been risen, then you might as well. Uh, Bob Nail, great friend. It, it, it's over, that's it. It's all she wrote. See what he's doing? He's taking their argument about this. We can't believe in this stuff and say, all right, what are you left with? 
What are you left with when you eliminate the mighty work of God? And then, of course, that wonderful three-letter word that occurs there in verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Let's stop with the nonsense for a little while and let's get back to what is real. He, he spent that early on. Remember, he appeared to me. He appeared to Cephas. He, spent, he appeared to 500 and more. Many of them who are still alive, go ask them. He returns them to reality. Christ has been raised. And that's their testimony. It's a testimony of so many of his followers that died for that truth. Let me tell you something, people. People will not die for a concoction. They will die for a conviction. They will not die for a concoction. Christ has been raised. He calls him the first fruits of the harvest. Why does he do that? Because he's introducing this whole thing that 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 part, that movement of the Messiah that the choir sang for us earlier. For all in Adam, that one man brought in death. Everybody has a relationship to Adam. If you were born into this world, physically and really, you have a relationship with Adam. And his pattern is now your pattern. And every man, woman, and child who was born, that's their pattern. It ended in death. But then he says, hey, wait a minute. The doctrine of the resurrection of Christ talks about a new pattern in the last Adam. And those spiritually reborn into him now bear that pattern. And that Adam, the grave couldn't hold him. So therefore, those who are in Christ, the grave will not be able to hold them either. The new pattern of your new head, the new humanity, the new head of a new kingdom is all what you ought to expect. Because Christ has been raised. There is life in Christ. A life so powerful that the grave could not hold him. But each in order, he says. Each in their own order. Why no new body now? Because that new body would be out of place in an old world that's still dying. Because Christ isn't finished with his work yet. That's what this whole very confusing because it's difficult to translate the original Greek about subjection and he who put all things under his feet. Let me, let me help you out with that. Christ is like a divine warrior king. He is still waging war against the work of the devil of sin and death. And as long as time continues, it's because he is still calling men and women to faith in himself. He is still regenerating hearts He is still plundering the kingdom of darkness in this world by Satan and sin and death and plucking out certain people and bringing them to light and life. And once everyone, everyone that God who has known before the foundations of the world has been brought into the kingdom, then the end will come and everything will be subjected just as it should be. The old order will be put away and the new fullness will come. We'll get more about that next week. A lot more. He's going to have a lot more to say about that. The body that comes at that second coming will be appropriate then because we're going to be led into the fullness of a kingdom that never ends. Never to be stained by sin and death or any kind of corruption ever again. All in proper order. That last enemy, he says, to be conquered is death. The last reality of the sin in your life. 
the last time it gets to have any say-so over you is at your death. But death can't hold you any more than it could hold your Savior. Absent from the body, what? Say it louder. Present with the Lord. Those who is bought are as his. And in each good order, the body will be turned. The victory has been won. The enemy has conquered. And the last show of it is when he brings all things to fruition. He'll put that final stamp that the old order of things is gone forever, never to be returned. Never to be heard from again. Never to have anything to say about that new order. The last enemy has been conquered. And then he moves on to talk about some other difficult issues that have come up. But he points it out in a very brilliant way. He points it out by, point, uh, by bringing to light, rather, the inconsistencies of some of these teachers. Some of these teachers who are denying the physical resurrection of Christ They also happen to be doing some other things. And he uses their inconsistent beliefs against them. You know, that's still a problem. This is nothing new. Uh, There's a lot of people that have inconsistencies in our faith as we continue to grow. There's a lot of, almost everybody wants to believe once saved, always saved, right? But there's a strange inconsistency with some of those that, want to believe that the only way you get into Christ is he doesn't have anything to do with it. You have to do that of your own free will. And for some reason, they want to believe that once saved, always saved. But it was their will that got them into it. Their will ought to be able to get them out to it. Oh, no, they say. There's inconsistencies that we're always having to deal with. And he points out one of these here. Why this foolish practice of baptism on behalf of the dead? Now, this is... I had to mention this because this has brought a lot of speculation and difficulty. I don't know why, but it, but it has. As you know, in the Mormon faith, this is a very real practice still to this day. But you see, he's not saying that that's a right practice. He's using it, even though it's full, he's using it to say, you're not even consistent in that. Because If you hold that Christ is not raised, why baptize on behalf of the dead? Why baptize on behalf of anything or of anybody, living or dead? Baptizing them to what? You see, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that the apostles approve of it. Theft is in the Bible. It's not approved of. Right? Lying is in the Bible. It doesn't mean we could go down the list, right? You understand my point? He's pointing out the inconsistency of this. He also goes on to say, if there is no resurrection, then why am I preaching and risking harm and risking ill fate to myself for those who hate the doctrine? Why do I keep preaching? Why do I keep putting myself at risk if it's not true? What's the payoff? As I said earlier, People will die for a conviction. They will not die for a concoction. He wraps up this saying by basically this last thing, stop listening to these foolish teachers. Stop listening to these foolish teachers. Maybe send them on their way. You know the thing about false teachers? They always know better than everybody else. They're the only ones that know it. That's a red flag right there. Stop listening to him, he's saying. If you want to go down that road with them, go ahead. But then, you know, you might as well be a happy pagan. Eat, drink, and marry, for tomorrow we die. Stop acting one way and another way inconsistently. Either Christ is raised or he's not raised. If he's not raised, then go be a happy pagan. If he is raised, it changes everything. It changes everything. It changes your relationship with your grave. 
it is no longer a dark shadow any longer. This nonsense about removing the supernatural works of God, the power of God from the gospel, so that it's more acceptable to mankind is laughable to me. It's absolutely laughable. I am here to tell you in no uncertain terms, my dear friends, and you are, if there is no resurrection, if Christ has not died for my sins, if he did not come into this world by the power of God in the virgin birth and live the life that was required of Adam and every image bear, if he did not sacrifice himself on behalf of me and my sin and atone for them and pay the price for them, if none of that is true, you can have my resignation in five minutes because I want nothing to do with it. If we're back at Mike has to do a better job and be good enough, I give up now. Uncle, the match is over. Because I'm here to tell you, I can't do it. Do you hear me? It's that vital, folks. It's that vital. If, there's, if it's just one method of better living, then let me choose the one that's going to make me the richest. The gospel changes everything. It changes everything. Working on this, and I was thinking about my friend Rick Piercy. And uh, a lady, who I still don't know her name to this day, at his service right here in this room. And many of you were at that service, and you know that Rick forced me to tell a joke at his service that we shared on one of our last visits and involved the hokey pokey. Afterward, this lady, very, very wonderful, nice lady, came up and said, did you guys really do that much joking around in your last visits together? And it was said with a tone of like, that didn't really happen, right? You're just doing that stage stuff. It's for show, right? I said, no, I, you know Rick, he had a great sense of humor. But then she said something. But we're talking about death. And it dawned on me. There's no hope without the resurrection of Christ. It changes everything. Rick's ability to have a sense of humor was about his own death was more than just his persona. Bob Nail, I could go down the list. We have a savior. We have a savior and he is risen. I need you to get in your Easter mode for a second. He is risen. He is risen it makes all the difference about our relationship with the grave. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you so much for your great word to us. Father, by the standards of this world, we understand this news seems too good to be true. But Father, this news is not a natural thing. It is not a man-centered thing. This is the good news of God Almighty, of Christ in all his holiness, of Christ in all his humility, and of Christ in all his power. So Father, we thank you for it. We praise you for it. And may that truth pulse through our veins every single day. And may you be praised forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn is 357, Christ Arose. Note that the hymn writer Robert Lowry does the same thing as Handel of contrasting death and resurrected life. Shall we stand?
now, brothers and sisters, may the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you both now and forever. Go from this place and love one another, even as God in Christ has loved you. Amen.